So hello again. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce you Professor Rain Road, but probably all of you know him. Professor Road is an Estonian scholar and author. He graduated from Leningrad State University, now called San, you know, San Petersburg State University, in 1985 in Japanese studies. And he earned a PhD degree in literature. Uh, literary theory, sorry, at the University of Helsinki in 1994. Professor Rode has worked in the Estonian Institute of Humanities, now part of Tallinn University, and the University of Helsinki, where he is currently a professor in the Department of World Cultures. From 2006 to 2011, Professor Rode served as the first rector of the Tallinn University. And next, in, in 2011 to 2014, he was the president of the European Association of Japanese Studies. He received an honorary doctorate also from the University of Latvia at the Viatautas Magnus University. As you probably know, as a scholar, Professor Rode has published on a wide range of subjects from cultural theory to pre-modern Japanese literature and philosophy both in English and Estonian. His work on Japan uh, has dealt with some of the most uh, phil important philosophical thinkers, notably of um, Dogen, who is going to speak uh, today also about uh, Dogen, uh, and Nishida Kitaro. He has been also awarded uh, the Order of the Rising Sun, second class gold and silver star from Japan 2011, the Order of the White Star, third class in Estonia, 2001, and the Commander's Cross for Services to Lithuania uh, in 2009. Many awards. <laughs> so, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> uh, so, it's uh, really a uh, great honor to have, I and mean, a pleasure, as I told you before, uh, to have Rain Road here again because he visited us in 2009. And it's always very welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Raquel, for the kind words. Uh, and uh, thank you also for uh, being our hostess here for the um, uh, first annual conference of the European Network of Japanese Philosophy. I'd also like to thank uh, Jan Gerrit Strala and uh, Morisato Takeshi uh, for their enormous organizing uh, work. Uh, and uh, it is really a great honor for me to be the first, so to say, academic speaker uh, in the history of this network. Thank you. <laughs> and now for something completely different. Uh, uh, there is going to be some really hardcore, I would say, triple X Dogen reading uh, toward the end of my presentation. But I will uh, start from more general things. Um, uh, some things that have to be considered whenever we uh, speak about uh, how philosophy is being produced uh, in uh, language. Um, one common misunderstanding that European philosophers sometimes share is that the world itself has a logical structure and that language reflects the logical structure of the world, of reality, that somehow the logic that we use when we construct our sentences, then we, when we construct our uh, utterances about reality, uh, is not a construction, but it is a reflection of what uh, actually uh, is there in the world. Um, Thinkers as diverse as, uh, for example, Edmund Husserl in Logical Investigation or Noam Chomsky uh, in his Syntactic Structures have shared this assumption, um, which nonetheless I think is completely wrong. Uh, according to this assumption, uh, the world consists of objects that have properties that relate to each other 
and some of these objects uh, also uh, perform actions, others undergo actions. And therefore, language has to have nouns and verbs, and nouns and verbs in syntaxes uh, correspond to subjects and predicates, and then we have elementary propositions uh, that there is a noun, which is a subject, which has uh, a predicate, which is an action or a property, and uh, that is that. Um, the two languages that have mixed together to form contemporary Japanese, uh, namely classical Japanese and Chinese, uh, neither of these uh, follows uh, or, or reflects this assumed uh, logical structure of the world uh, as, as I uh, outlined it uh, a, a few moments ago. Um, I will start with speaking about classical Japanese because this is the language in which Dogen wrote. Uh, and uh, classical Japanese, uh, well, uh, many Japanese people are tricked into the assumption that classical Japanese is a kind of a previous uh, sort of uh, outdated ver version, like, you know, Windows Vista or of contemporary Japanese. Uh, uh, but that would be as true as to say that Latin is a, a, a previous version of Catalan, right? Uh, actually, classical Japanese is a different language. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, really <laughs> different language. It follows a different internal logic, as I uh, hope uh, to show you in a few moments. Some elements of this logic have been preserved also in contemporary Japanese. Others have been abandoned. In classical Japanese, uh, in the cultural configuration of uh, uh, of classical Japan uh, was the language of the female-dominated private space and also of literature, of poetry and fiction mainly. Uh, some poetry was also written in Chinese, uh, but uh, uh, mainly poetry, was, uh, poetry and fiction was written in classical Japanese, while uh, official documents, histories and so on uh, were written in the male-dominated public space in uh, Chinese. Um, here is one of the most famous passages in classical Japanese, uh, the um, beginning of uh, the pillow book of Sei Shonagon. Haru wa akebono, yoyo shiroku nari yuku, yamagi wa sukoshi wa karite, murasaki dachitaru, kumo no hosoku tanabikitaru. As rendered into English by Meredith McKenney. Uh, in spring, the dawn, when the slowly paling mountain rim is tinged with red and wisps of faintly crimson purple cloud float in the sky. Um, let us look at, at the first three words. Haru wa akebono. In spring, the dawn. This is a thematic structure. Uh, this is uh, what corresponds to the elementary proposition in the logic of classical Japanese. Uh, we are not saying that uh, spring is dawn, but for spring, the dawn. As far as spring is concerned, dawn applies. Um, thematic structures do not posit uh, identifications. They posit correspondences. They say that there is a certain meaningful overlap between the semantic fields of haru and akebono. There is of A and X. Different Xs can apply to any A at different moments. There is no way to say that something, some A is identical to some X because it doesn't happen. Both A's and X's are situations. They are states of affairs. They are not context-independent entities. And uh, uh, as you look at the um, uh, table of Go, um, it's a really very enlightening game in, in the sense that you think of uh, Go and chess. Uh, in chess, you have um, uh, chessmen who have their identities, who can move, who are in certain positions and so on, while in Go, uh, you are placing on the table um, white and black stones so that none of these white and black stones by itself has any meaning. The only thing that has meaning in the game is how these stones relate to each other. I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with the rules of Go. I hope uh, uh, some of you are, so you understand what I'm speaking about. Um, but uh, 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 Go is... Um, uh, in Go, you're playing with configurations, you're playing with uh, relations between uh, uh, different points in a territory, not with independent uh, character-endowed 
uh, chessmen or figures of uh, some kind. So, in Japanese, it is impossible to formulate identity statements because things don't have identities. Um, in fact, there are no such things as things. Uh, or if we are speaking about things, uh, they are uh, also configurations. They are uh, moments in processes. And uh, when we're speaking about uh, different things, when w w the only thing that we can express is an overlap, a meaningful overlap, something that has meaning. Uh, of course, this has philosophical consequences, and uh, it is um, uh, even difficult to say whether the language was there first and the philosophy came later, uh, or was it the other way around? Uh, Transcience. It's impossible of state to state permanent relations of identity, therefore, we kind of, uh, if speaking Japanese, we kind of are, are more prone to the idea that there are no permanent entities, that things just like happen and they also go by. It is an essentially dynamic world. Uh, it hasn't, doesn't have any absolutes, any constancies. Uh, it is a language in which Nishida's logic of predicates makes sense. Uh, entities take place in the world through mutual determination. Uh, you probably all remember these long uh, kanji sequences, zettai uh, mojon teki jikko doitsu, and so on, um, which um, uh, uh, express how the world is. And also another phrase from Nishida, hataraku mono kara miru mono from the agent to the perceiver. Uh, I think uh, we could understand that in the sense that the perceiver does not precede the agent, it is a derivative of the agent, uh, it is always already embedded and involved uh, in the world uh, that it uh, perceives. And consequently also the embeddedness. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too long on, on, on this, but uh, the essentially spatial character of um, uh, anything that can be uttered in uh, Japanese. Um, we could say that Japanese is an event-oriented language uh, while there are also object-oriented languages, uh, and I don't mean the computer languages that are sometimes called uh, by that name, but uh, event-oriented languages where, where which look as, at the world as a process, uh, thematic constructions. If the object language says A is B, the event language says as far as A is concerned, B applies. Now, uh, uh, some of you may have recognized uh, Kitano Takeshi from uh, Battle Royale, uh, as the teacher of uh, uh, that class. Uh, so uh, here he is saying, I am a teacher. Watashi wa sensei desu. One of the first lessons in Japanese uh, uh, that, you all, uh, that you get is that you can use exactly the same structure to say, Watashi wa sushi desu. Uh, doesn't mean I am sushi. It means as far as I am concerned, sushi applies. I would like to have sushi. Um, in an event-oriented language, nouns appear in normal sentences primarily as qualifiers of actions and not as independent entities that are somehow there. And most objects in classical Japanese, as you will soon see, are referred to by verbal forms. And um, when you study classical Japanese, your teachers tell you that uh, these verbal forms are nominalized, that they are turned into nouns somehow, because in Western languages, there should be nouns there. But they're not. They're verbs. They're, they stay verbs, and uh, calling them nominalizations is just uh, a way to, um, I don't know, um, refer to a bad habit of yours as a, a uh, uh, an idiosyncrasy or, or something like that. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, verbs are verbs, right? Uh, even though for our modern grammatical convention they may be called nominalizations. Now let us look at some more of Seishonagon's wonderful work. Uh, here is um, uh, Seishonagon <coughs> describing uh, what uh, a man should ideally behave like when uh, in the morning uh, he's about to go home uh, after spending uh, a passionate night uh, with 
uh, his uh, mistress. Um, and um, uh, if you look at the Japanese, you really see one uh, reference to the uh, uh, to the persons uh, uh, who are uh, mentioned in this episode. Whereas when we look at the English translation, we see 15 mentions of uh, he, she, and so on. Because uh, English cannot do it uh, without uh, always indicating who is doing uh, uh, what. And uh, if you look at this, uh, you see that uh, how this uh, he is called. It's warinaku shibu shibu ni oki gatage naru. Yeah? Uh, a verb uh, which describes or points to uh, the man and so on. Um, and uh, when we try now technically to translate this uh, passage of Sei Shonagon into English so that we uh, keep verbs for verbs, what we have is effort makingly urging the incomparable incomparably time-takingly seems being difficult to rise, saying, sunrise passing, passing, whoa, painful to look, and so on. The sighing view is truly not satiated and will also be gloomy, it seems. Also trousers and so on, while sitting also not putting on, first nearing, saying the remainder of things said at night into the woman's ear, though there is seemingly not making any effort, belt and so on seem to be tied. Uh, this is what Sei Shonagon's prose would look like if we would translate it adequately uh, from uh, classical Japanese into uh, English without substituting uh, uh, nouns uh, uh, where uh, they should be in uh, our opinion. Now, Chinese. Uh, the eternal other of um, uh, Japanese thinking uh, and so on, a language uh, which operates completely differently, uh, the language which used to be the uh, language of the male-dominated public space and also of Buddhism. Um, Chinese also doesn't make, uh, or, or, or Chinese also doesn't have the logic of nouns and verbs. Why? Because it doesn't have nouns and verbs. Uh, in Chinese, uh, you have uh, morphemes uh, which have a semantic field and can perform as our nouns or our verbs or our adjectives or anything else, um, just as they have to uh, in a syntactic construction. Rules of words are only identifiable in syntagms. Uh, we have to have uh, more than one character, more than one sinogram, in order to understand what kind of a role this sinogram is performing. I have identified five possible relations uh, between uh, Chinese characters, and basically this is all there is to it uh, in classical Chinese grammar. What you do when you, when you read a classical Chinese text is you identify what kind of relations are there between two characters, then they form a group. This group will now, as a separate unit, on the next level, have another relation, either with the uh, character next to it or the group next to it. So uh, basically what you have to do in order to understand the classical Chinese text is to identify uh, first the relations between characters and then before, uh, between the groups that uh, they form. There are five of these. Uh, there is juxtaposition, as in uh, San Sui, yeah? which uh, mountains, waters, together they are landscape, right? Predication, ka shou, the house is small. Characterization, myo getsu, the, uh, uh, the radiant, uh, uh, the bright moon. Uh, then there is direction. Direction is not only uh, the uh, verb object relation, it can also be, uh, uh, it is broader. Yeah? Uh, as in Japanese, you say michi o aruku. Yeah? Uh, uh, you are walking a road as if it were an object, your action is directed uh, toward, uh, or your walking is directed toward the road. And then there is modification. This is a, a purely grammatical function, like in e zen, uh, e doesn't have a, 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 a sort of um, self-sufficient uh, uh, meaning, uh, but uh, it modifies the, uh, the zen that follows it. Now, uh, here is one of the most famous classical Chinese poems by Li Bo, and uh, uh, here it is, uh, well, um, if you uh, 
had noticed these uh, marks, juxtaposition marked by a plus, predication by a tilde, characterization by a colon, direction by an arrow, and modification. Uh, we won't see much of that, but uh, just um, a, a tilted line. So, uh, what Libo writes is, bed, front, bright moonlight, dot this, ground up frost. Rise head, gaze bright moon, low head, think old home. Uh, and uh, we get the meaning uh, when we see that uh, bed is a characterization of front, they together form a group which is in the relation of predication with another group uh, where there is moon light, light characterized by moon, and then that is in turn characterized by bright, and we have uh, a, a, a syntagm uh, of, of such groups. Now, doubt has a direction toward another group, uh, which is this in predication with uh, ground up frost, and so on. So, uh, basically, what you have to do in order to understand the classical Chinese text is to identify which of these five relations uh, uh, obtain between two characters and how they are trans uh, uh, they, they build into, um, uh, into uh, 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 higher uh, structures. Um, you can see that this has, uh, 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 this is not a self-evident thing. Many Chinese texts uh, actually use the, uh, uh, they, they have uh, the same structures, right, like doubling in, in certain rhythm so that it would help you uh, to understand what kind of relations uh, are obtaining there. Uh, and uh, sometimes, uh, especially in the time of Song uh, dynasty in China, where there was vigorous activity of uh, uh, studying ancient texts, where the Neo-Confucians were studying old Confucian texts and rereading them, uh, and then uh, uh, rereading also frequently meant that they were uh, questioning the traditional assumptions. They, they were questioning uh, what the traditional commentators had, uh, what kind of relations they had read into uh, uh, these sentences. So here is um, uh, two lines from the first chapter of Tao Te Ching, which would be, no name, heaven, earth, beginning, is name, 10,000 thing, mother, right? And uh, uh, normally we read this, together with um, Wang Bi from the third century, uh, uh, who says that we should read it so that no and these would be characterizing name, and then there would be a relation of predication uh, with the rest of the, uh, of the sentence, uh, which here we have heaven and earth in juxtaposition, uh, together characterizing beginning, and 10,000 characterizing thing, and they together characterizing mother. And we get the nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth, the named is the mother of myriad things. Not according to Wang Anxi, the ill-fated Chinese prime minister of um, uh, 11th century, who says, no, we should read a relation of predication between uh, the no and is and the rest of this. And we should read name here as uh, an action which is directed toward the rest of the, uh, of the, rest of the syntagm. And what we get is, non-being names the beginning of heaven and earth. Being names the mother of myriad things. Something quite different. Both of these are actually valid interpretations. Uh, most of the time, uh, people who are using classical Chinese for their daily purposes uh, just, you know, picked uh, the most probable interpretation according to the context. Uh, my favorite example, uh, not invented by me, unfortunately, is that uh, if you take the sentence, time flies like an arrow, you could also interpret this as a particular species of insects, time flies, uh, who uh, are adore you know, a certain weapon, uh, an arrow. Time flies like an arrow, right? Uh, and it's also grammatically correct, uh, while uh, sort of like out of place, uh, but uh, you couldn't say that, uh, for example, a computer uh, uh, couldn't translate it uh, 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 like that, uh, uh, just because computers don't have uh, our, you know, background assumptions uh, of how things go. So, um, in Chinese, what you quite frequently get uh, are ambiguous passages or ambiguous syntagms uh, where you can substitute one relation for another and get a totally new meaning. Now, uh, closer to Dogen, uh, in Dogen's times, 
Uh, the uh, classical Japanese uh, of the kind that Sei Shonagon was writing uh, started to give way to a mixed style called Wakan Konkobun. Uh, there was a tendency uh, to, to mix Chinese and Japanese uh, linguistic structures and, and, and so on. Uh, also because the, um, the male and female linguistic media uh, were united into a bipolar space of expression where, where you could have Chinese dominated text and Japanese domi dominated text but both used also uh, certain uh, numbers uh, or, or certain uh, resources of the other. Um, word stock, Chinese word stock uh, came to be domesticated by the Japanese. Uh, normally Heian ladies uh, didn't really know any Chinese or they were not supposed to know Chinese because this was um, uh, the, the male thing, uh, the male language. Uh, but now, little by little, uh, uh, Chinese words uh, start to crawl into, uh, into Japanese. Um, but uh, as I hope uh, to have convinced you, uh, these two languages operate according to a different internal logic. So these two separate linguistic logics uh, were uh, integrated uh, into one whole uh, and for Dogen this created an enormous opportunity to express thought which is between these two logics. Uh, he is not writing in Chinese and he's not writing in Japanese but he's using Japanese to sort of uh, deconstruct Chinese and he's sometimes using Chinese like to bypass uh, things that can't be uh, done in uh, classical Japanese. Actually these two logics persist to this day for example, uh, you can say in Japanese, tadaima raikyaku chu desu ne? Uh, as far as the present moment is concerned, come guest within applies. Or uh, something that you hear very often, raiten itadakimashite arigato dansu, having humbly received come store, we are grateful. Eh? Uh, I'm using uh, capital letters here for um, uh, uh, things that are uh, uh, originally following the Chinese logic and uh, uh, and, and small letters for, uh, for the Japanese uh, logic. So technically, this is uh, how it works. Right. Dogen, the fascicle gabio, a painted cakes. Um, let us look at the translation first, maybe. What is called the painted cake, one should know, is the original face of when father and mother were born, the original face of before father and mother were born. Using rice flour, the immediate suchness of putting the recipe into action, while not necessarily within birth and non-birth, is a moment of the way becoming a parent. One should not internalize this uh, circumscribed, circumscribed by perceptions of the cake as coming and going. Uh, we're not going into the uh, uh, philosophical meaning uh, of this text at all. We are just trying to kind of dismantle it linguistically to get to the sort of like core of how, uh, how, how language is able to uh, produce uh, these uh, things. And what we get, I'm using hashtags here uh, for uh, grammatical uh, uh, indicators. Uh, so uh, you have the shirubeshi is no need and uh, uh, it is directed to paint cake, which is a qualifier to cold, and here we have uh, uh, another Chinese block uh, and another Chinese block, both with predicate relations uh, to uh, Japanese words, uh, and uh, so on. And uh, uh, in this way, it is possible uh, to take Dogen's text apart uh, and uh, to, to take, take it down to the sort of assembler level uh, where uh, you can see how concepts are uh, emerging. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously this is not necessary always for uh, doing a correct translation uh, of the uh, original, but sometimes uh, it is. Sometimes it helps us uh, to uh, uh, formulate uh, uh, certain, um, uh, sometimes it helps us to uh, get closer to uh, uh, the places where Dogen's philosophical thought uh, is being born. Uh, because, uh, well, this is uh, probably known to uh, all of you, uh, Dogen works by substituting the uh, uh, 
apparent linguistic, uh, the apparent uh, relations that obtain between uh, semantic moments in a syntagm with something of his own liking. Uh, he's uh, transforming uh, concepts, uh, uh, he's making concepts out of, uh, of, of, of a sort of linguistic hooliganism. Yeah? Uh, his, uh, 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 he says, time flies like, an arrow, flies like an arrow, about insects, absolutely. And, uh, uh, and what he does uh, with the meaning, is, uh, uh, with these new meanings, uh, is where uh, he gets his uh, philosophy uh, from. So, a few conclusions. Um, certain conflicting basic assumptions about reality are embedded in the structures of Chinese and Japanese. Uh, the language that we call modern Japanese operates uh, with two conflicting linguistic logics. Uh, this has not always been the case, but this was a new thing when Dogen started writing. Dogen's work is the first major effort to uh, write philosophy or philosophical texts in Japanese. And uh, of course, being talented, uh, being uh, uh, you know, the great poet actually that he is, uh, he's making use of all the resources, the linguistic resources uh, that uh, were there. And uh, if he had written uh, in Japanese only or Chinese only, the result would not uh, have been like that at all. So uh, the joint usage of two linguistic logics allowed Dogen to manipulate both of these logics in order to push the expressive capacities of both these languages to the extreme. Thank you. some time uh, for a few questions if you like to ask something or comments yes please um, I right, good um, so that's a good start <laughs> and our language wants to reflect that, we need verbs and nouns. I actually don't know any realist who would put it that way. I somehow have the impression that you put your, um, let's call it maybe linguistic essentialism, according to which language forces some logic on us, to moder especially modern realists. I, I mean especially Chomsky, for example, I mean he wouldn't say that uh, to really to be able to talk about the world as it is, we need nouns and verbs. I mean, he knows a lot about different grammars, uh, not to not to to commit such a such a fallacy. Um, maybe a short second remark. He said that classical Japanese is the language of uh, of the female written language, isn't it? I mean, men talked classical Chinese, didn't they? No, no, um, uh, the written language, yes. Okay. But this may change your point a little bit because it's, it is the language, there are speakers who, who, both, who use both languages at the, so it's not really, a, it somehow sounded like it is a, is a very disclosed area that, that uses this language and this is, uh, yeah. Not the case, um, I would say. Um, maybe uh, uh, in order to have, um, uh, not like you having like all your questions, and uh, maybe I could respond to these and then you could go on, okay? Um, uh, first of all about realism. Um, I actually uh, remember a passage of Logical Investigations by Husserl where he says exactly that in almost these very words that uh, uh, the grammatical structure of um, German, we should suppose, uh, reflects uh, how things are in the world. And uh, realism, if you think uh, of modern realists like uh, Graham Harmon, for example, uh, who uh, ends up with uh, a really interesting 
I would say, a theory of Buddha nature, <laughs> uh, even though he doesn't uh, use these, these words. Uh, but in, in speculative realism, also Harman says, well, let us start with common sense. There are like things in the world, they have properties, and uh, we have nouns and adjectives to characterize them. Uh, so uh, uh, there might be different realist positions, and uh, I am not saying that uh, language is something that forces a logic on us. Uh, I would uh, uh, say that uh, uh, just like, you know, hypothetically, uh, it is um, more plausible to think that things are there in the real world than that uh, they are not there. Uh, and uh, 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 it's just that uh, our language is an effort uh, to conceptualize the world but it is not an accurate reflection of uh, how the world is. And uh, there are different efforts to conceptualize of the world, uh, and uh, they are all uh, equally correct. Uh, so uh, whenever we say that Western language is somehow conceptualized of the world more adequately than, uh, 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 let's say, Chinese or Japanese, uh, then we are committing a, a, a racist fallacy. Um, uh, now, uh, about the, um, uh, uh, the question of male and female uh, uh, spaces, this is uh, something that, uh, uh, well, Arthur Whaley, who was the uh, uh, first translator of uh, the, tr the tale of Genji, said, uh, for a Heian lady uh, to know Chinese would be approximately as preposterous as it would be for uh, one of the chambermaids of Queen Victoria to uh, uh, go in for boxing. Uh, so, uh, uh, Whaley was wrong, of course, because Murasaki actually knew Chinese, uh, the author of The Tale of Genji. She did it by uh, accident. She had a stupid younger brother and a scholar for a father, and the, the father decided or wanted to, uh, to teach his son to be his you know, great successor, and Murasaki was just like hanging around. We don't know what her name was, actually, uh, because uh, Heian ladies are like... Uh, characterized uh, or, or named uh, after rooms they, they lived in or, or some male relative or something, or nicknames, and Murasaki is a character in, in the tale of Genji uh, whose sobriquet was, was given to the author. So uh, uh, she was just like hanging around, and because she was so, so bright, she picked up all the Chinese, all the, all, uh, all the stuff, uh, but she was uh, the exception. She was uh, a scandal, actually, uh, uh, because of that. Uh, so uh, uh, the language of the public sphere, uh, the written language of the public sphere was Chinese. But uh, you're correct, I, I should have said that, that uh, obviously uh, what they were speaking to each other was Japanese. And also, um, uh, most probably, uh, for uh, uh, a certain time at least, uh, most Heian men, when they were reading Chinese aloud, they were reading it as if it were Japanese. They were kind of like translating it into Japanese as they read. Uh, but uh, uh, that's, um, mm, uh, 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 that still doesn't alter the fact that uh, Chinese was like restricted. May I have yeah, sure. one remark? Sorry, please just raise your hand so I can 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 pass the mic. Maybe uh, yeah, one more remark to as to the realism. Um, I mean, you said that. I mean, there are different conceptualizations of the world, and of course, I agree with that. Uh, you said, I mean, there are all these conceptualizations, and they are all justified. Here, I think I don't agree. I mean, the all is quite. Tricky. <laughs> I mean, well, there as are long as they work, faults. as long as they work, I mean, language is a tool. Language is a tool of communication, of explaining uh, or describing the world and so on. And if a certain group of people uh, who share the same language decide that this language is okay, uh, then uh, it works uh, and it's not uh, ours to tell them that they're wrong. I'm not convinced, but. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. You touched on many things I'm very interested in. And actually, uh, I have comments on everything. But uh, the only thing about Chinese right now, because it came up 
in the conversation as if Chinese language has a different logic from Japanese and classical Japanese, a different logic again from modern Japanese. And then there is the gender association. But I wanted to point out, uh, to begin with, kanji, Chinese characters were used to transcribe manyo poetry collections, and they were called manyo gana. Use of kanji, both phonetically and semantically, is already visible there. So I think that's something we need to be careful about. And then about uh, the knowledge of Chinese among the court ladies, actually the mother of Emperor Teishi, em Empress Teishi, she was so fluent in her knowledge of Chinese, and she was such a welcome addition to the court parties because all the men needed a woman who would understand Chinese and who could compose in Chinese, and that's how she met the future husband, and they uh, you know, gave birth to Emperor Teishi of Sadako, who died at the childbirth at year 1000, and then the other one, Shoshi, became you know, Michinaga's uh, daughter, became uh, the next consort. But the knowledge of Chinese was not so uh, looked down upon. So I think we need to be, again, very careful. And Murasaki Shikibu, for example, she taught Chinese literature to the empress upon her request. And emperor, having found out, he actually gave a beautiful copy of the poetry collection by Bai Jui. So, you know, I think we need to be very careful mm. when we say this, that, because I'm discovering so many exceptions, and when there are so many exceptions, you start to wonder. Mm. Yes, uh, well, um, uh, uh, we could say that these were the early feminists, you know, uh, who <laughs> were uh, venturing into the sort of male-dominated territory and doing things that were normally uh, uh, supposed to be for men. Uh, because, well, uh, you know, uh, when Murasaki was introduced to court and then uh, uh, the emperor had a, a, a little bit of look at her, uh, you know, writing, said, what? She has read Nihongi? Can't be, you know, because she's a woman. Yeah? Uh, Actually, th that was a rumor uh, began by other ladies who mm. were not very happy with her mm. <laughs> mm. erudition. So, again, we need to be careful. Another thing, use of hiragana was first experimented by a man, Kino Tsurayuki. He said, this is a new thing called hiragana. And I'm curious, because now we are supposed to keep our diary in Chinese. But what's the potential of this new form? Yes, but, so, she, but he, also, he also uh, uh, posed as a woman. Yes, uh, yes, he said, well, diaries are things written normally by, by men, men, but let's, uh, yes. let a woman now try to yes, do the same thing. Yes, but you know, well, you know what was going on is that everybody knew Kino Tsurayuki was experimenting. So everybody knew it was a man. And it was a known fact. And it was almost like a joke. You know, I mean, the in joke in a sense of making clear male, female territory. In other words, I think w this is again something I'm not so happy because, mm. you know, if it is, uh, an, uh, okay, if it was uh, experimentation was begun by men and women perfected it, I mean, uh, what? can we say about that? So it just to nuance the whole discussion. And uh, I don't want to take up any more time, but I'm completely, I, I went back to complete tabula ra rasa and then begin from there as to how, you know, Chinese and uh, Jap whenever the hiragana stuff were used. So it feels to me like you are buying into all of this kind of a built-in uh, prejudices in some way and try to make sense out of that. I think our job maybe is to erase it once mm -hmm. <laughs> and rebuild because I think that there is a lot more hmm. that we don't give credit to. Yes. Well, uh, as to the Nara period, uh, the situation was different then. Uh, that is true. And uh, 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 at Nara times, we can't... Uh, uh, what I was talking about is the sort of solidified uh, high classical culture of the Heian court, uh, because that was the backdrop uh, for uh, Dogen and, and the, the, the court cultural education that he had received. 
But um, uh, then again, uh, the question of, uh, uh, yes, Hiragana, the, uh, uh, the, the ninth century poets, uh, both men and women, wrote uh, in Hiragana, and uh, men were supposed to know Hiragana because uh, otherwise, how could they correspond with women, right? Uh, who are not supposed to uh, 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 know Chinese, even though, uh, yes, well, exceptions, uh, of course, but uh, that was still, uh, the cultural norm, as we say, uh, for example, that uh, uh, we have a complete equality of uh, uh, sexes, but uh, uh, if you look at uh, any, you know, national parliament, uh, you don't find a 50-50 there, so uh, uh, it's, it's not always that the norms or the prejudices and, uh, and what actually happens uh, in society uh, uh, correspond to each other very well. And uh, um, so uh, that would be the uh, uh, that would be the normal assumption uh, 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 when we look at uh, uh, the hay and court linguistic situation. So that there is a sort of sort of a, a, a gender bias there, uh, and. Uh, uh, I do <laughs> disagree with whether this is morally correct, uh, but uh, uh, if we just erase these things and, uh, uh, and don't look at them, uh, uh, then it's also not very informative uh, in a sense that we have to, we have to acknowledge that these things uh, were there, uh, just as, uh, as this was a completely elitist culture, for example, and, uh, 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 and a very... Mm, in, in many ways, very. Yeah. Even in today's conditions, that we can see gender bias. Hmm. Um, what other evidence can I see? Yeah, sure. Uh, no problem there. I mean, that's not a, a sort of a solid wall uh, between men and women there, uh, but it's more of uh, uh, of, a, of a certain. Let's say it's a bipolar system where the. Uh, uh, the area of overlap uh, was minimal in the beginning and it increased later. Uh, uh, we could put it that way, yes. Thank you, Thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Andrea Altobrando. So, um, I'm not a big expert of Japanese philosophy actually, but I would like to say something about what you said about Husserl and the problem of universal grammar. Because it also seems to me that it is a bit too simplified the version you gave of, well, maybe there is a statement in the logical investigations, but there are also many other statements. And one thing is the universal grammar, and then the, you, you have the ontological commitment of a universal grammar. And I think for people like Husserl, it, and also for uh, Chomsky, I suppose, it's quite clear that two things do not have to go hand in hand. Moreover, what you have done today, it seems to me to use a kind of universal grammar in the sense Husserl, uh, Husserl was uh, thinking about. So to identify some logical operators and so on, and then in communication, in normal communication, in linguistic expressions, we have ambiguities. But we can decide which kind of grammar we apply to the expression. And then what he was suggesting is going back to a pre-predicative level and so on and find our experience, if our experience justifies a certain interpretation of a sentence or not. And that is, in Husserl, I admit, quite easy. So it, he was not so very good in the pragmatic of language. But the idea is that there is something in our experience which tells us that this kind of expression read in a certain way works or not. So, and in this sense, I think, this is an idea we do not have to give up, otherwise we commit ourselves to a kind of racism in as, uh, as far as lingui uh, languages are concerned. So I think you have actually shown me today that this idea is totally fine. <laughs> so. Well, um, that was certainly not my intention, but uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yes, I agree with you that uh, uh, we try out uh, certain tools and if these tools work, uh, we kind of uh, adopt them also for further use if they are corroborated by our experience and so on. That's, that's how we work. Uh, but the point is that these are still tools and uh, uh, different languages operate with different toolkits. And um, for example, uh, 
uh, if you are, a, well, as a speaker of a, of a Western language, uh, you might find yourself uh, really um, kind of kind of like incapacitated sometimes uh, uh, if you are compelled to speak a non-Western language uh, for a long time because there are so many things that have to be said that you cannot do because there are no tools for that in that language. Uh, while uh, there are other things uh, which for you may seem to be completely kind of irrelevant but you have to always take uh, care of. For example, Estonian, my native language, doesn't have gender. Uh, uh, no languages except Indo-European and Semitic uh, Hamitic languages have gender, so uh, 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 I am always, you know, troubled uh, if I am speaking a language where you have to, uh, you have to have uh, adjectives uh, uh, with gender, you know, uh, for the uh, uh, for the nouns, because. I don't know what the noun is that I'm going to use. I'm still looking for it, but I, I know what the adjective is. So I have, uh, well, there is a certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, but the certain has to be already gendered, right? Uh, so uh, 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 I, uh, that, that always troubles me. Eh? And uh, uh, so you have, uh, 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 some people consider gender to be a, a meaningful, uh, always present attribute of uh, whoever uh, does and, and, and thinks and so on. Uh, other people, uh, like me, uh, don't feel that need and, uh, and uh, uh, I am kind of like oppressed by uh, languages that have gender, while uh, some other things that my language has uh, are absent from Indo-European languages and uh, uh, I'm... I'm uh, so, uh, uh, no language is the perfect reflection uh, of uh, reality. All of them are conceptualizations and all of them uh, are corroborated by the experience of uh, those people who use them uh, and they change also uh, and they are, uh, 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 that's, that's how we should look at them. Uh, and uh, um, when we say that, well, this language is better suited for expressing universal truths, for example, then that's not really a good idea. Lorenzo, and then you, please. agree more. I mean, uh, Japanese is, is a prime example of how a language evolves and, and uh, adopts different tools and so on. And uh, 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 yes, uh, uh, but there is, uh, and, and there are so many different possibilities of style, you know, different possibilities of using Japanese. For example, uh, you mentioned Akutagawa, but uh, uh, Oe Kenzaburo, for example, is being uh, uh, sometimes criticized as if uh, he would be writing in English with Japanese words, right? Uh, because uh, uh, he uses uh, his internal logic of Japanese is, is, is kind of non-Japanese. 
and uh, 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 just from the from the um, domain of translations, uh, uh, I was recently told uh, by a colleague uh, that uh, translations from different languages into uh, 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 some language actually look different and you can identify the underlying thought patterns of that uh, source language also in the translations because the translator wants to kind of uh, adopt the uh, uh, or, or, uh, or be adequate as adequate as possible uh, so uh, you can look at the trans uh, uh, at several translated texts in a language and uh, with any luck you could say which language they are translated from um, as to um, uh, the, the, the question of space uh, and uh, emptiness and um, Yes, well, that was not my topic today, but uh, you're completely right as well uh, that the uh, that the question of uh, uh, the, the question of emptiness or the question because if we um, if we think of reality uh, mainly as relations that relations are primary and uh, the uh, points between which these relations are uh, are secondary or constructed in the process. Uh, then obviously relation uh, is, is the thing that can be t can take place in, in, in emptiness. And uh, I would say that uh, 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 emptiness as a place of no relation uh, would be something else than the emptiness that is constitutive of, uh, 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 of reality, like the shiki sokuzaku uh, in, in the uh, Heart Sutra that uh, uh, it is. Um, Modern physics, right? Uh, let's not go there, but uh, uh, still, uh, we would say that uh, uh, that coal and diamond uh, consist of the same thing, uh, the same kind of atoms, and the only thing that makes them either coal or diamonds is the emptiness that is between these atoms. Right? Okay. Next, you. Yes. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. Um, by the way, my name is Yui Nutsuka from the University of Tokyo. And uh, yeah, I was very um, uh, happy to hear your presentation as your explanation on classical um, ancient Japanese and Chinese was very, um, very clear. Yeah, I had learned a lot. And uh, I have two questions. And one is, the first one is pr pretty simple. How do you, how do you characterize the modern Japanese uh, in terms of, in relation to, in comparison with the ancient Japanese? As you have, in the beginning of your introduction, uh, you have said, I um, know, uh, in, the, in the beginning of your presentation, you have said some elements of ancient Japanese have uh, has been abundant in modern Japanese. And I'd like to know what kind of element has been abundant not just in terms of like some words were not used, but in terms of logic. Hmm. And uh, so, and the second question is a little bit um, complicated. The, it means that the, you, I find some, uh, like um, you have mixed up some different, um, different phase of language in the, comparison of Jap ancient Japanese and Chinese. It means that uh, I'd like to say, so you have introduced ancient Japanese as event-oriented language, and its relation to the you know, uh, Western uh, European language of having a certain subject and verb. But then when you are talking about the language of Chinese, you have introduced it as the, the logic of relation, and it, it's in terms of how the how these words, how the language is written, and but then it still have some subject and verb, sim in, right, similar as European language, but then so when we are talking about the characteristic of Chinese is how these words are uh, uh, interpreted. But I find like Chinese is still quite um, different from event-oriented language in, 
in the sense it's quite similar to European language that it has a certain subject and it has a certain verb. And it's just the, uh, the interpretation. When, when we read the Chinese, we have to find the where the subject is and where the, object, the ab adverb right. is. So it's like. Yeah, I think I understand the question. <laughs> um, the first question, right? Uh, uh, what are the things that uh, modern Japanese doesn't have and, uh, and classical Japanese has? Uh, in modern Japanese, uh, you do not have the distinction between the third and the fourth uh, primary uh, form of uh, verbs and the shushike and the renyoke. Yeah? Uh, so uh, you say hito wa yomu and yomu hito uh, in the same kind of way. Yeah? Uh, while classical Japanese makes that distinction. And uh, you have... Uh, 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 you have a different form uh, for uh, the attributive function uh, of a verb or, a, or an adjective. And uh, this attributive function uh, also uh, can, used, can be used independently uh, as uh, something that you would say like yomu koto. Yeah? In classical Japanese you would just say yomu. Uh, uh, and Yes, yes, they are both, they are both event-oriented language, languages, and uh, in some senses, modern Japanese is even more event-oriented than classical Japanese is, because uh, most of the nouns in, in modern Japanese uh, are, uh, um, uh, you know, borrowings from Chinese, uh, which can be both verbs and nouns. My absolutely favorite example is what you hear in the metro of Tokyo every day, Shibuya yuki wa tochaku desu, ne? Uh, so, Shibuya Yuki is a verb uh, which uh, refers to a train. Tochaku is a noun which refers to the action that this train has performed. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, 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 there is no, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, uh, the matrix of uh, verbs and nouns does absolutely not correspond to things and actions uh, in, uh, uh, in reality. Mm. Right, exactly, yeah. Um, uh, the second question, uh, is Chinese a, a more object-oriented language than, uh, uh, than Japanese? Um, well, yes and no. Uh, in Chinese, uh, the distinction between parts of speech is irrelevant. Uh, some people uh, who write Chinese grammars uh, say, well, we have nouns in Chinese. I'm, I'm speaking about classical Chinese now. Modern Chinese is different. Uh, 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 that uh, we have nouns in Chinese, uh, and nouns are the verbs, uh, the, the words that most often appear as subjects in sentences. And then we have verbs uh, in Chinese, which are those words which most often appear as predicates uh, uh, in sentences, which is complete nonsense in the sense that uh, both these nouns and verbs can be uh, can act as uh, the other uh, if the syntax is, is, is construed the other way around. Uh, it's just a sort of a correlation uh, which does not, uh, there is no morphological or, or uh, any other indication of uh, this is a noun and this is, uh, this is a verb. Um, but uh, uh, the distinction, um, I, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, Western languages absolutely make this distinction as well. Uh, for example, uh, you can use the word fish both to uh, indicate uh, a certain little uh, thing moving around in the water as well as the action of catching that thing. Yeah? And uh, if we say, uh, well, uh, we can directly translate from English into Chinese a sentence which would be big fish eat small fish. Uh, and uh, you interpret the sentence exactly the same way by putting these, uh, uh, you know, uh, operators between there. And uh, if we could use uh, uh, the verb uh, fish, saying like big fish, fish, small fish, that then would be uh, even closer. But uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, fish doesn't fish. <laughs>
Thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. I'm Hitoshi Oga from Yamaguchi University, Japan. Um, I asked the same question last night while drinking, but um, unofficially. <laughs> so let me ask the same one officially today. Um, so I was so shocked, honestly, when you said Dogen was the first philosopher in Japan. Um, but well, of course, I was wrong. Kukai was before him. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, but you know. Um, could you tell me the definition of Japanese philosophy uh, to understand why you think Kukai or Dogen uh, was the first philosopher in Japan? What's, what's your definition of Japanese philosophy? Um, I would, I'm afraid I would have to uh, use another hour for that. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, simply. Uh, um, uh, I have written a piece uh, uh, which appeared in Philosophy East and West uh, some years ago, which I can send to you, uh, where I'm uh, 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 debating with Corinne de Fort on the subject of whether a non-Western thought could be called uh, philosophy. And uh, uh, I think it can, uh, uh, because the alternative would be to say that uh, philosophy is a certain kind of Western cultural practice. Uh, uh, and in that case, philosophy would not be able to to claim, you know, uh, uni for universally valid uh, statements. Uh, but to say that uh, there is a certain cultural area in the world which has, like, you know, direct access to uh, uh, God and universal truth and everything else uh, just simply doesn't wash. Uh, so if we have, uh, uh, if we want to say uh, that there is something in philosophy that applies uh, regardless of its cultural context, then we have to also concede that philosophy can take really, really many different forms, and uh, 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 Asian, uh, African, uh, other forms of philosophy are possible, uh, which do not follow the same patterns uh, as were evolved from uh, Greek thought uh, in the West. Um, I think we can characterize philosophy with, uh, by, by uh, uh, well, well I, I really like uh, the definition that Deleuze and Guattari give uh, uh, for philosophy in their What is Philosophy book, uh, saying that philosophy is the production of concepts. And concept uh, in, uh, uh, the, uh, in the uh, definition of Deleuze and Guattari is not just like simply concepts that refer to certain things, but concepts as, uh, you know, fertile, crossroads of uh, different uh, streams of thought that uh, uh, are able to, you know, produce uh, new thought. So Kogito, for example, uh, is, a, is a, a, a good example that Deleuze and Guattari give for, for a concept. And um, uh, when we look at Dogen, well, what is he doing? He's like, you know, uh, a fountain of concepts, uh, like uh, Uji or uh, g g g all that, you know. Uh, uh, he's, uh, uh, the activity that Dogen is most, mostly engaged in is precisely extracting concepts uh, from the uh, available to him intellectual heritage. He takes uh, Chinese Zen lore and uh, takes, you know, like two side-by-side uh, -side, uh, sitting characters out of there and he can write, you know, uh, 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 <laughs> a long essay uh, of uh, how these characters, the combination of these characters reflects his understanding of the world. So yes, Dogen is a philosopher because he produces concepts. Okay, uh, I should understand it for now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any further questions? Mm -hmm. ah. um, <coughs> Bernard Stevens. Well, I would just like to thank you for your talk and for your remark right now because reading your title, I had quite a different expectation. I thought you were going to... I didn't expect... Um, linguistic and grammatical remarks as you gave us, which I find a bit difficult to follow. I mean, my knowledge of the Japanese language is far beyond your, uh, far beneath yours, <laughs> and I'm not capable of um, having a, a correct opinion about that. I thought you were going to talk about something like um, Luther, the creator of uh, German literature, or something like that. In what sense the fact that Dogen writes in Japanese even if it's a, a particular way of writing, uh, renews uh, Buddhist thought, which, which until then was written in proper Chinese. Uh, and you didn't really uh, talk much about that, and that would be my question. 
Well, um, Dogen, uh, Dogen could really have uh, his own conference, you know, uh, because uh, the answer to your question is again one that couldn't be given very shortly. But uh, uh, if Dogen would have re written his uh, stuff in Chinese, uh, well, that would have been impossible, no? Uh, because uh, uh, the deconstruction of uh, uh, these Chinese structures uh, that appears uh, constantly on Dogen's, uh, in, in Dogen's writing uh, is precisely the philosophical activity that he is engaged in. And it could only be done uh, in another language than Chinese, uh, because it would be only possible to highlight uh, uh, these uh, alternative, uh, uh, alternative conceptualizations, the uh, alternative translations of these Chinese concepts or, or interpretations of these ch Chinese words if you did it in another language. Uh, you couldn't do it in Chinese because uh, that would be a sort of a closed circle. So, uh, 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 as Dogen is uh, a r very different thinker from Kukai, for example, who uh, wrote in Chinese uh, and uh, who was a sort of a system builder, uh, uh, a proto-structuralist, uh, 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 a semioticist, yeah? then, uh, uh, then Dogen is more of a, uh, of a, of a system destroyer because uh, systems uh, are between him and uh, the uh, uh, correct understanding of, uh, uh, or, or the direct understanding of, uh, uh, of reality as such, or suchness. Uh, so, uh, of course, they, they have very different styles of, do of thought, and they also have very different uh, uh, strategies of, uh, of how they go about their business. Well, perhaps the last question, because no, it's possible, but just a uh, few more. John Moraldo, uh, mm -hmm. thanks very much for a very clear and uh, interesting lecture. Um, of course, what you're saying presents a great challenge and problem for translation. So, um, I mean, how, what do you think translations and translators should do? Should they <laughs> try to explain something about the the background language and its grammar? Mm -hmm. Should they do something like the charts you gave the original Japanese and then putting it in uh, mm -hmm. some kind of um, structural mm -hmm. analysis and then giving one of many possible mm -hmm. interpretations? Or, or wha how, how do we avoid giving the um, false impression that this language more or less corresponds pretty exactly to the language in which we're translating. Mm. Yes, well, I have been struggling with this very problem, you know, for years, and uh, uh, I really don't have a satisfactory answer. I think that just as it is with poetry, uh, it is impossible to translate and it is necessary to translate. Uh, because otherwise, uh, uh, the heritage of uh, uh, other cultures would be close to us if we wouldn't translate. But we should probably just like accept that uh, any translation is um, uh, a part of our culture uh, because it, by translating we introduce these texts to our culture. Uh, uh, so it is within our culture and uh, well uh, Ezra Pound has once said that you could uh, write the history of English poetry just by reading translations of ancient uh, Greek literature. Yeah? And uh, like uh, how uh, the translations change, they change with every uh, you know, period because different things are highlighted and different styles are adopted and different understandings of what ancient Greek literature was like and so on. And, uh, and that's fine. And uh, we do have you know, uh, numerous translations of Dogen or, or uh, uh, other uh, uh, Asian philosophical works, and uh, we need to have more. Uh, and uh, maybe it is so that uh, every age uh, needs uh, its own dogan, right? And uh, um, uh, but but more particularly, uh, well, one way would be uh, indeed to have a translation on the left page, for example, and uh, comments on the right page, uh, uh, as actually Japanese editions uh, quite often do. 
And uh, it will also be possible, I was, I was once thinking that I would do a translation of Dogen, which has uh, two different translations of the same text side by side, uh, so that one of them would be using uh, Western technical philosophical terms, and the other one would be kind of poetically uh, close to uh, uh, Dogen's uh, uh, own style of expression, so that the reader could read these and uh, uh, sometimes wonder <laughs> whether this is actually the same same text, uh, uh, but uh, 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 that would perhaps be the uh, well, one way to do it, but uh, uh, probably no normal publisher would accept uh, that kind of a translation. Uh, uh, so um, uh, ultimately this is probably a question that every translator must uh, solve for her or himself, uh, that uh, we, um, uh, 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 we try to do uh, the best we can, and uh, uh, what else can we? <laughs> If I may, <laughs> my not last question, but uh, comment. Uh, would you agree that uh, what you have been saying about this trait, uh, the event-oriented language, is what is uh, of Japanese and Japanese philosophy, the Iran words? <laughs> uh, yes, I think that is uh, one of the uh, great <laughs> advantages of Japanese philosophy to be able to broaden our scope uh, of thinking by having a differently structured linguistic medium at its disposal. And it is, of course, as John also said, a great challenge for uh, Westerners to go uh, beyond the linguistic structure and, and try to express these same things uh, in our differently structured languages. And uh, 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 that, it, that might also be one of the great contributions that Japanese philosophy has to make uh, to uh, world philosophy in general, to, uh, uh, to show that uh, it is not a closed circle, that there are different ways mm -hmm. and, uh, 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 to, to, and different, different um, kinds of conceptualizing uh, the world and of extracting concepts from these conceptualizations. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful talk. <laughs> thank you again, please. <laughs>